when it comes to knitting with mohair, we've all got some questions. And so for today's video, I plan on doing my best to answer some of those questions that came up based on last week's midweek ramble, which was all about knitting with mohair. So if that sounds like just your cup of tea, get comfy and let's dive in. Hello, 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 and welcome to the Wool Needles Hands Midweek Ramble. My name is Taylor and I will be your host. For today's video, we are exploring some questions about knitting with mohair yarn, and that would be in the form of mohair silk or mohair on its own, just anything that has to do with mohair, and then a little bit with baby Surrey alpaca. You know, the floofy lace weight yarns that you pair with other wool base yarns. Last week, I shared a video on uh, last Wednesday about seven reasons that I like to knit with mohair and why you may want to consider giving it a try. And there were lots of questions that folks still had after that video, which I absolutely love. I think it's really great when videos can be thought provoking or generate more questions. And I like to explore those questions further in future videos. And so here we are today. Dear Mohair, we have questions. I want to go over some of the questions that were asked in, well, as many of the questions that were asked in the last uh, midweek ramble video as I can and provide some insight, possibly some answers, and maybe even ask some additional questions here in this video. So I'm hoping that by the end of this video, you take away a little bit of additional insight, a little bit more information, and overall just become a little bit more of an informed maker when it comes to mohair and then possibly baby Surrey alpaca as well. Now, before I get started, because I think it may be asked and I think it's really cool when it is, I am wearing a Felix pullover today. This is a very heavily modified Felix pullover that I knit a few years back. I knit this using Plotilope by Istex, which is unspun Icelandic wool. And I paired that with a strand of kid mohair and silk by Fiber for the People. I talk about this sweater in the last midweek ramble last week, so you can watch that and learn a little bit more. But that is what I have on today and I am wearing it with a long sleeve turtleneck underneath because it's still pretty chilly outside and I have a really hard time wearing this next to skin. Um, and, and that has much, almost entirely to do with the Plotilope, much more so than the mohair. The mohair is actually rather soft. So that's what I have on today. I will link to my Ravelry page for this down below in the description box. Okay, so what I've done here is I filtered out the comments from that video to show me just comments that have questions. And then there were a few comments that slipped by that filter. So I'll grab some of those as well. And I'm going to do my best to answer as many of these as possible, or at least to provide some additional insight. If you have additional insight that you can lend to any of this these questions here, drop them down below in the comments. Okay, the first one I have here is from Rula Wellington. It says, I've heard that knitting with mohair held with another yarn can cause certain designs like cables and textures to be less well defined. Would you say there is any truth to this and possibly why that might be? Thanks. Yes, I would say that there is absolutely truth to this. Now, that doesn't mean that you should abandon any prospect of knitting cables or lace work with mohair. I think that you really need to do what inspires you. But if your goal is to make sure that the cables or the lace work or the stitch pattern really is the star player and that that is very defined and crisp, then you're going to want to knit with anything that has a really hairy fiber, meaning you want to avoid anything that's going to have have any kind of a halo. And that's not just mohair and that's not just baby Surrey. That could be some Norwegian wool, some Icelandic wool that tends to have really long hairs spun into the yarn. Now there are really fantastic Icelandic wools and Norwegian wools that are perfect for cables because of how toothy they are. But you really have to look at the yarn and make sure it's just not too hairy, just not too floofy and fuzzy because those parts of the yarn are going to create a halo when it's knit into the fabric. And that halo is almost going to work a little bit like a blurring effect to any stitch pattern or cable motif that you are working into your fabric. And if that, again, is the star of the show, you don't really want to waste your time knitting all of that and putting all of that work into it only for it to be blurred out in the final product. Next question is from Suzanne Roper. It says, hi, Taylor, love your channel. So much information and great pattern ideas. Thank you, Suzanne. Question for you. Superwash wool has a reputation for stretching. Can you stabilize superwash by knitting it with a mohair or a surrey, which I think are not stretchy? Will the mohair silk or alpaca silk blend be able to make the superwash behave? Thanks in advance for your answer. Okay, 
Yes. In fact, I find that adding, so with my Felix pullover, I wore this in the last, no, I didn't wear it. I showed it in the last episode. Um, not a Felix. I'm sorry. My no frills, uh, pullover by Petite Knit is knit with 80% superwash merino, 20% nylon. So there's already some stability in there from the nylon, but I am using a superwash merino in that sweater and I'm pairing it with Kid Mohair Silk. And I am telling you that sweater has never shown any signs of stretching or losing its shape or lacking resilience. And I credit that to the nylon in the wool blend yarn, but I also credit that to the silk in the mohair as well. Another thing to consider here, especially in terms of resilience and stretch, mohair can actually stretch an average of 30% over its length. So it does have a considerable amount of stretch and then it will be able to spring back to its original shape. And for this reason, mohair is really great at being wrinkle resistant and resilient over time. So when it comes to that resiliency and stretch factor that you're after, mohair has it and it's going to make up for any lack of resiliency in a 100% superwash wool yarn. Now, silk, on the other hand, does not stretch and is not very resilient, but it has the strength to boot and that's going to lend to the durability of the overall fabric. Something else that's kind of fun to know about mohair is that diameter for diameter, it is actually stronger than steel. And that is what's considered its tensile strength. So when it comes to durability, mohair is where it's at. As for Surrey fiber, I don't know the exact tensile strength there, but it is incredibly strong. And that is just because it happens to be a very long staple strong fiber, not necessarily anything to do with the diameter, but you are going to get that durability and the benefits of that durability, even if you're using a base be Surrey alpaca blended with silk. Now, Surrey, however, is not stretchy and is not resilient. So even though a Surrey silk blend is going to add to the strength of the fabric created with a superwash yarn, it's not going to contribute to the resiliency. So if you're looking for resiliency and stretch and snap back, and you want to add that back into the fabric because you know that that's not going to be there with the superwash yarn, your safer bet is to go with the mohair silk blend. However, when it comes to durability, both of those fibers are exceptionally strong. Okay, Andrea Miller 6200 asks, so timely for me, I've just received a sweater quantity of knitting for olive, which will be fingering paired with mohair. Woohoo! Don't know if this came up, but what about knitting only with mohair without pairing it? I have the mohair for another sweater and wondered if there are any tips and tricks for working with mohair alone. I have four tips for you when it comes to working with mohair all by itself. Tip number one, use sharp needles. You don't have to worry about splitting mohair as typically if you're working with mohair alone, it's going to be a lace weight fiber. However, it is super slippery and having really sharp needles to help get up and under those stitches is going to be very beneficial and overall save you a lot of frustration. The fuzz and floof of mohair can make it really difficult to identify the stitches on your needles, especially if you're working in poor lighting. So you're going to want to give yourself the best edge possible and you need to knit in really good lighting, preferably natural light. But if you have a neck light or something that can really shine a lot of light on your project, that's going to help you as well. Mohair is an absolute nightmare to tink back or to unravel or to frog. It's absolutely infuriating if you've ever been in a situation where you need to do that. Now it's not impossible, but what makes it really difficult is if you need to frog back to a particular place and you need to make sure you end at a particular round or row or stitch. And so my advice here is to use lifelines when you knit with mohair. If you think there's a chance, you may need to go back and reevaluate fit or shape, put in a lifeline because you're not going to be able to do that accurately with mohair all by itself itself. Another thing you want to make sure you definitely do with mohair, and honestly, you should be doing this with anything that you knit outside of maybe socks, is to block your finished project. The mohair fabric really opens up and blooms beautifully once it's been blocked, and it allows those stitches to move into place and to keep from being locked together with all of those individual hairy fibers. Block it gently, just like you would with any untreated or non-superwash yarn. Lay it out, shape it, let it dry, and you'll be so happy that you took the time to do that. Last but not least, be patient. 
Mohair is not the easiest thing to work with on its own. It has so much going on that can be really distracting and make it difficult to see what you're doing. So you're going to need to be patient. Patience is really ultimately on top of all of this key. Okay, JA Traveler or Jaw Traveler 1277 says, I started a wool hat yesterday using mohair. My first attempt with mohair, it is okay. Thought the mohair was more variegated, but it is not adding much to my Northfield Valley yarns and purple haze. So a learning process. Question, can you knit socks with mohair and fingering weight yarn? Thanks for the information on using mohair. Yes, you absolutely can knit socks with mohair and fingering weight. You can blend that together for a really lovely DK weight sock. It really adds a lot of elasticity and durability to socks, especially if you're using a superwash yarn otherwise. One thing I would say though, is if you are knitting a pair of socks using mohair, be very conscious about the ground that you walk on. Adding mohair to yarn makes things very slippery. So if you happen to have tile floors that have very limited texture and you're walking around on those floors or even hardwood floors that are polished or whatever, anything that's remotely slippery, you're going to turn things into the ice capades if you're wearing a pair of socks with mohair because that mohair is exceptionally slippery. So yes, you can knit super cozy socks with mohair. It makes them very strong. It makes them very resilient. It'll hold up to wear and tear, but it makes them incredibly slippery. So be very cautious. So just be really careful if you are knitting socks with mohair, which I definitely encourage you do um, just to have some really cozy slip on socks while you're sitting around on the couch. Um, but yeah, if you have hard floors or slippery floors, you have to be really careful. Okay, Stacy Burley says, I have questions that have prevented me from trying mohair. My first question is, does it change the washability of Superwash Merino? In other words, do I have to worry about felting it? Also, when knitting with Superwash, I know it will grow when blocking. How does the silk mohair change what to expect in terms of things growing when blocking? Thank you for all of your wonderful videos. You're welcome, Stacy, and thank you for the compliment. Okay, when it comes to adding a strand of mohair to a superwash yarn, you're not going to change, or I should say, no, yes, to a superwash yarn, you're not going to change the washability of the superwash yarn. That yarn has been treated and its washability is what it is. And mohair doesn't felt. Now, you could over stimulate the mohair or agitate the mohair and cause the little hairy fibers to become much more tufted and less soft and floofy, but you're not going to felt the mohair and that mohair is not going to cause the superwash yarn to felt, even though I don't think that was the question. What you are possibly impacting is the overall washability of the fabric you create with the superwash yarn and the mohair. But felting is really not going to be an issue if the yarn you're using as like your base yarn or your conventional yarn is superwash treated. Mohair has a very thin surface to the hair fiber and there are really very undefined scales along that shaft of fiber. So agitation is just not going to cause felting like it would with a wool fiber. So you really can go forth not having that concern that you're going to felt anything with the mohair. It's not going to impact the wash washability to that extent. However, if you are pairing mohair with an untreated wool yarn, the mohair is not going to keep the untreated wool yarn from felting. That will felt if you add too much agitation and heat, regardless of having mohair paired with it. Even though that wasn't part of the question, I figured I would add that. In terms of the other part of this question that says, how does the silk mohair change what to expect in terms of things growing when blocking? You're really adding a lot of resilience to your project by adding mohair to superwash yarn, like I mentioned earlier. So if you're worried about a superwash yarn growing or stretching and you could add a strand of mohair to it, up the weight of the overall yarn a little bit, you're going to be saving the overall finished item from that fate. So adding that mohair and silk to a superwash yarn is really gonna do a lot to help prevent stretching or losing shape in the future. Okay, this question is unrelated to mohair, but I'm gonna answer it really quick. It says, off topic, I can see your spinning wheel in the background. It's right there. Um, may I ask, what is the make? That is a Lendrum double treadle spinning wheel. And believe it or not, I've been getting itchy fingers to pull it back out. And I've actually been messing around with it a little bit. So, okay, back to mohair here. 
Okay, this one is from Ryan Kens. Hi, Taylor. I love the information your video. Uh, I love the information your videos a lot. Thank you for this informative one. I have a question. Are mohair and kid, kid alpaca always combined with silk? Is it possible to just add only mohair? Because I don't like the way silk is harvested. It is not always combined with silk. And if you have any kind of reservations about using silk for whatever the reason, there are options out there for you that are combined with nylon, some that are combined with a really fine, thin strand of merino wool, and some that are combined with acrylic. So they are not always combined with silk. I know that the company Hobby has a couple of options that do not use silk. But if you were to Google kid mohair, yarn without silk, you're sure to find options that have the same characteristics of yarn in terms of the weight and the overall look, but minus the silk content. And you're going to save some money. Okay, this question kind of goes along with that previous one. This is from Laura Chesham, uh, 2005. Hi, Taylor. Just want to ask you a question about a yarn I'm pairing with my wool for the Frankie Cal. It's Surrey Stratus, which is Plymouth brand, 68% Surrey alpaca, 32% nylon. It seems to be compatible with the, page, the Patton's wool. My local yarn store recommended it because when I purchased it, my thought was that I didn't want to spend a lot on a sweater. I completely understand that. I thought I might... Um, I thought I might mess up. However, I'm loving it, but now I'm worried about the nylon content. What are your thoughts, by the way? It was $7, so I thought it was a good quality for not a great deal of money. Like I said before, if you want to save some money, but you don't want to sacrifice the durability and the resiliency um, of a mohair yarn, and you still want that mohair content in there, finding one that's paired with nylon is perfect. It's absolutely perfect. If that fits your budget, it's going to look fantastic. And it's a really great alternative if you want to avoid using silk. Okay, the next question I have here, I cannot for the life of me find it. Um, it was there and I read it before filming this, but I'm going to answer it here anyway. And it was something to the effect of the quality and the price of various different mohair yarns and why one particular mohair might be more or less expensive than another and why one particular mohair might be more coarse and itchy than another. And this is a thing. There are qualities of mohair and it is going to dictate the price and then obviously the texture and the feel against your skin. Now, one thing that you really have to understand is that mohair comes from the Angora goat and the younger the goat is, the more fine and soft the fiber. If you are purchasing a mohair yarn and it says specifically on the label that it contains a certain percentage of kid mohair, you are purchasing the softest, most fine mohair on the market. However, if the yarn ban just says a particular percentage of mohair, you are not getting kid mohair. You're getting the mohair from an older goat, which means it's going to be more coarse. It's going to be a little bit more scratchy. The quality and durability and all of that, well, I shouldn't say the quality. The quality in terms of fineness is different. The durability is still the same. However, you just may find that it's not as nice to wear next to skin. So yes, there is a big difference in quality. If you want the softest mohair possible, you're going to want kid mohair, which is shorn from a young Angora goat. Okay, the last question that I'm going to answer here, and this might be one that prompted you to click on this video in the first place if you were looking at the thumbnail. And this is regarding the ethical treatment of the goats in order to produce mohair yarn. Um, let me see if I can find, okay, it says from Christine Gibbons, Taylor, is there such a thing as ethically sourced mohair? One that does not compromise the animal at all. I live in the UK and have access to knitting for olive, but when I Googled mohair, it said there is no such thing as ethical mohair. Would love your thoughts. Okay, so this is a question. I feel like you could ask this same question about any fleece or fiber animal in terms of is there such a thing as ethical merino wool? Is there such a thing as ethical Peruvian highland wool? Is there such a thing as ethical alpaca and ethical cashmere and all of these various different things? Because when it comes to the ethics of this you're getting into animal welfare, animal husbandry, the treatment of animals when shearing their fleeces and all of that comes into question as it rightfully should. And those things are really important to consider. However, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about mohair or cashmere, the same question can be asked and similar answers are going to come of those questions. 
Are there instances where mohair fiber or the fleece from a sheep are shorn in a way that compromises the well-being of the animal? Yes, there absolutely are instances of that. And there are reasons why those types of things happen. For example, when you pay a shearer by the hour versus paying them by the number of animals they're shearing, you have opportunity for fewer of those situations because they're being paid by the hour no matter how many animals they shear. They're going to be more careful because there's less concern for getting as many shorn in a, an amount of time as possible. Whereas if you're paying them per animal, they want to shear as as many animals as they can before the sun goes down or before they can no longer shear anymore because that's ultimately what's going to be lining their pocketbook. And so these kinds of things can dictate when or the potential for the mistreatment of the animals. It's not in the best interest of any farmer or producer of fiber to compromise their animals. It's not in the best interest because those animals cost them a lot of money and they want to make sure that they are taken care of so that they continue they can continue to use them to produce the fiber. Now, of course, animals can reach a particular age where they can no longer produce fiber of a quality and then there's that. But it's not in the producer's best interest to put these animals at risk. That's something to consider. Does that mean that in every instance, animals are just treated with the utmost quality? I can't guarantee that and I don't have an answer for you. And that's why this has become a topic of discussion is because they're trying to make these sorts of practices much more transparent. Another thing when it comes to this that I, I tend to kind of know a little bit about, but I have my own questions is when they're asking these questions, and I'm, I'm not meaning this person asking a question here, but when this topic comes up, I tend to think that a lot of this is directed at the mass-produced fashion industry and textile production for that industry, not necessarily the production of yarn for crafters and knitters. Now, I'm not saying that it doesn't happen in that production. I'm just saying that if it's going to happen, chances are it's happening in a different market than what we are working in. So for example, if you're going to go purchase a skein of kid mohair silk from Fiber for the People, for example, I can tell you that my supplier ensures and provides information um, certifying that they, they source all of their fiber and all of their yarn from places that use ethical practices and maintain the highest of standards for animal welfare. So I can tell you that because I'm more in communication with my supplier and I feel like the chances are that any yarn purveyor is going to be very similar um, because the market's different. But when it comes to the things that you're reading on the internet, when you Google mohair and you see things that PETA are, you know, putting out there to inform people, I have to think that a lot of that is being directed towards the mass produce, fa produced fashion industry. And it's just something to consider. So when it comes to whether or not there is such a thing as ethically sourced mohair, yes, there absolutely is. And you can do your own research and dig around as much as you can. You can email, you know, yarn dyers or companies that produce or sell yarn. You can ask them and they should be able to tell you. Um, but that's hard to do. It's hard to do for everything that you purchase. Now, you can do it and I'm not saying that you shouldn't. But you do have to decide at the end of the day if that's what you're willing to do or if you would rather just not use it at all. And that choice is yours. And that's the beauty of the situation. Now, one place that you can look, and I don't know how many producers or textile companies or clothing companies or whoever is, is seeking out the certification, but there is such a thing as the responsible mohair certification, kind of like the global organic textile standard. It's a certification that you can receive if you are a producer or a retailer of mohair that lets your consumers know or your customers know that you do strive to meet the high standards of ethical mohair practices and this and that. And you can look this up. You can go online and Google the standard and see which companies fall underneath that umbrella. For me, at the end of the day, when it comes to the way I look at it, um, I'm wary about some of the textiles that are produced for the mass, you know, fashion industry. So I would be very much less likely to purchase a sweater containing mohair from a mainstream retailer than I would have any 
qualms about purchasing a skein of mohair yarn from a yarn retailer. I recently purchased two cashmere sweaters from the company Madewell. And the reason I purchased these cashmere sweaters um, was, well, number one, they're cashmere sweaters and they're absolutely beautiful. But something that really pushed me over into purchasing them is that they were made from recycled cashmere, which I really, really love because there is so much cashmere textile in the world that is not being used for clothing or anything for that matter that can be repurposed into beautiful cashmere sweaters. I love when I see that. I would far rather do that than purchase a brand new cashmere sweater. Um, so when it comes to, you know, being concerned about ethically sourced mohair, I think that's where you should really be a little bit more wary or cautious is like purchasing a mohair sweater from like the Gap, if the Gap even sells something like that. That's where you're really kind of venturing into that like, ooh, where did this mohair come from? How, what was the demand for this textile to create this sweater that is probably one of millions, whatever. So those are, that's kind of where I think you really need to be thinking about that um, or putting a lot of that energy into thinking about that. That doesn't mean you shouldn't think about it in general. You absolutely should. Um, and do some additional research. But to answer the question, to keep it short and sweet, is there such a thing as ethically sourced mohair? Yes, absolutely. Especially when it comes to yarn that you're purchasing for knitting. Um, I don't worry too much about that. And I do care an awful lot about these sorts of things. But I feel... I feel confident that you don't need to worry so much about the yarn that you're purchasing from yarn retailers, even those yarn retailers that tend to be much bigger in terms of scale. Any additional insight anyone has um, that you would like to provide down below in the comments, please understand not everybody is vegan. Not everybody chooses to completely forego using animal products. And so it's okay to emphasize that you feel that that's important, but don't belittle anybody or make somebody feel less than because they choose to use products from animals. Um, that's not what the comment section is for. However, if you do have some additional insight into this particular question that is fact-based and can provide us with some information, making us more informed consumers, I welcome welcome that in the comment section. So thank you so much in advance. Well, folks, that is it. That's all I have for today. I think I hit most of the questions unless some questions have come up since I've recorded this, but that was really great. I kind of like these videos, well, not kind of like, I really like these videos that are like, you know, X topic, we have questions. I don't know if you're into that, but there are some of these, like I did short rows, dear short rows, I have questions. And I think it's kind of cool because it sheds light on the questions we all have. And I love to do the legwork to find some answers to provide you guys with some additional insight. So if you like this format, I would love to keep doing it. I feel like there's lots of opportunity for it. It's just a good time overall. But for now, I think that's all I have. If you took value from today's video or enjoyed yourself at any point, please don't forget to give the video a thumbs up. Definitely subscribe and click that bell icon so you can be notified anytime I upload new content here on the channel. I want you to benefit from the content here on the channel, so definitely subscribe. And until I see you again for Sunday's episode of the podcast, Happy knitting, happy making, happy whatever it is that you're doing. Take care, be well, and I will see you soon. Bye.